Um, and I do feel that those shakings and you're seeing signs of it. And I believe that God can show us the signs so that we are ready for what is going to take place when it's going to take place. Now, I don't believe God wants um, chaos and anarchy and everything to just collapse. But I do feel that you get some signs and I believe we should be asking God for the signs to say, what? let's get ready. Let's be aware. Someone who is new uh, in terms of learning the mystic mysteries um, and, and learning religion and all those things, I just want to know what does it feel like to live in the presence of God? What is it? Um, well, there's all sorts of different ways of engaging the presence of God. And, and depending on what God is doing within that setting will determine how you feel. If I was just to say how I dwell in the presence of God, in the per with the person of God, that makes me feel totally loved, totally accepted, totally affirmed and approved of. So everything that we really need as a person, you begin to find in the presence of God. And as he reveals his heart to you, you begin to come into the knowledge of who he is by experience as love, but also you begin to become aware of who you are. So our origin is found in him. And as we learn to dwell in his presence, um, another word would be to abide. So we live there. It's not something we just go and visit. When I first started engaging heaven, I would go and visit. So I'd go into heaven, I'd come back out of heaven. Um, I'd have an experience and I would come back with that experience. And then that experience would sometimes challenge me to live differently or I need I try to understand the experience. But actually, as I learned to dwell there and not just to visit, but to live in his presence and abide in his presence, then it's a continual flow of life, which God is love. God is spirit. Yeah. And in that sense, you say God is light. And so there's also this sense where God reveals himself in his true nature. And that is why deconstruction takes place in our thinking about God, because the God that we experience face to face in those relational encounters of abiding there, dwelling within his love, changes our whole perspective of who he is. So the religious God that we've probably all been brought up with the God who is to be feared and you've got to be careful that you don't upset God and you've got to appease him and you've got to be obedient to him. You've got to try and please him with everything you do. That God puts you under pressure. And if you don't do that perfectly, you feel like you failed, you feel guilt and shame, condemnation. Whereas within the true relationship with God, there is just acceptance. There is no condemnation. There is no fear to be had. There's no need to be afraid that we don't meet a mark. Because which mark are we going to meet? Our mark? Some religious mark? Or actually the true standard that God wants us to attain to is actually just being ourselves. So we don't have to attain to anything. We just have to be us. The us that God made us to be. And that really comes by dwelling and abiding in his presence because he begins to reveal the truth um, to us that changes how we feel about ourselves. And certainly it's definitely changed my whole perspective of who I thought God was. When I truly met him face to face, he was very different from what I was taught to expect him to be. And God, when I talk about God, I'm talking about Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Some people would slash mother because there's a family. So I'm talking about being included in the family of God. And that's what it feels like. I'm at home. I'm where I always belonged, where I lost sight of. And now I'm being restored back to where I've always come from. The origin of my design, where God thought about me, where God formed me in his thoughts, in his desires, and he created me. 
And I'm going back to the knowledge of that. So back to family, back to intimacy, back to relationship. And all those things are aspects of being in the presence of God and enjoying his love. Um, and so that's just one aspect of it. You know, when I go and sit on the Father's lap on the throne of grace, and I might have a need or an issue, I just come and completely unburden myself. And I feel his heart, and I feel his heartbeat, and I feel his desire for me. And so that's uh, an expression. Sometimes when I go before the throne room of God, I just want to fall on my face and acknowledge his greatness and who he really is. And so it depends really on what situation you're in will determine how you feel and what happens in that experience. Because um, they're all been very different. You know, I've been for the judgment seat and now there was no shame or condemnation or guilt, but there was certainly a, oh, look at my life, you know, but nothing came from judgment from God as in, look at your terrible life it was oh look at all the opportunities i missed or look at, and then he gives me the opportunity by cleansing all that and washing all that away without any negative judgment on it that gives me an, the inspiration to just continue so you know i've engaged the altar and i've been in the fire and i've been you know all sorts of different experiences and they affect how i encounter the experience from my soul's perspective generally and often i'm feeling things because of the limitations of my soul so i might feel regret that i didn't see that or i didn't see this but no, there's no condemnation from god god is just wanting to show me how much he loves me and therefore, I have to have my mind changed away from the performance of well, I didn't do good enough or I'm not good enough or look at all the things I missed. or And I could begin to condemn myself and think I'm not good enough. And all God does is completely purge that from my whole scroll. So my life is full of, of gold, silver and precious stones, no wood, hay and straw because it's consumed by fire now god is a consuming fire so that fire is his love so even when i might be on an altar i'm still experiencing his love now i know that truth now when i first started to engage the altar his love began to change how my soul engaged him and free me from the fear perfect love casts out fear freed me from that oh is god going to be happy with me or is he going to be pleased you know um and i realized that god's always happy god's always pleased god loves me so those experiences changed how i perceived god rather than it didn't change god god has always been the same he's never changed but my perception of him has changed dramatically by those experiences yeah and each of them has a different part to play in my life you know and some of them are joyful and playful and expressing being with god in a sense of just hanging out with him and enjoying creation and life no it doesn't even have to say anything it's just we're um, we're together in relationship you know and at other times sometimes there can be amazing conversations or me listening mostly to what he's sharing with me which again shows me how he values me to give me that time with him so quality time makes me feel loved and accepted and affirmed because he's never never too busy for me so all of these sort of little experiences all have changed how I see God, how I feel, and how I perceive who I am to reveal who I really am. So it's changed me. It's changed my perspective of who God really is. And overall, it makes me lived loved. So I'm living in a state of being loved. And that is all coming from his presence.
and you can dwell there continually. It's not something you just have to dip in and dip in out of. You can consciously be aware of who he is and that I am with him and he's in me. Because it's not, you know, my experiences in heaven are parallel with my experiences within. Because he dwells within the secret place of my heart. He dwells within me. And as I open my heart to him, as I open my life to him, he fills me. And again, within me, there's a change and transformation that's taking place. Yeah, you know, so it's, it's a big question <laughs> uh, or a big answer to a question, um, which all of us will have different experiences that we can share and different testimonies of what it means to us. And it will mean probably different things at different stages in our life. Um, but all of it is good. Yeah, you know, that, that's what I found. When I first started to encounter these things, there was an element of fear from my soul. Because I, like, can I, how could I be in the presence of a holy God? And I just, you know, when you look at yourself, how could you be in the presence of God? And of course, people will say, well, you can't look at God's face or you'll die. You know, and, th and that's just nonsense um but it's there in the background in lots of things so initially there was a sense of oh am i going to be okay here when i went to engage the fire of god's presence for the first time my soul was like quaking you know will i ever come out of this place or will i be consumed by a fire but then i didn't know that that fire is the same as his love yeah but now i do I can embrace those things in a way which is way beyond my initial experiences of them. So it, it grows and develops. And as you change and we change, then our experiences change and we can enter in more deeply because all the things that hinder us and restrict us, which are things he doesn't want in our lives, those are the things that get consumed by the fire of his presence until there are no restrictions or hindrances left and we we celebrate and rejoice at being in his presence recently i've you know i i used to almost always just receive breath mm -hmm. and uh you know his life and it's just i experienced that fully but i've i've recently been engaging the vast some of his thoughts that he has about me and it's and it's and it's so overwhelming and encouraging and positive that um, I just wanted to share that with the prior question. And then also his heart um, recently more and more. So it's just it's just been so unfolding in a really amazing uh, way. The other thing I would say is the more I engage in the heavenly realm and go up there, it is so encouraging always. Like it's as if you score the goal in the Euro Cup and won it for your country the acceptance the encouragement the love the affirmation it's so um affirming who you are and so i would just add that um but anyway i i wanted to just in, in, um, ask you mike last year you gave a great testimony about your garden mm -hmm. and the fruitfulness of your uh, uh cherries blackberries or whatever they were like i can't remember but at, nonetheless, you, there used to be just a few here and there, and then you you engaged uh, creation, and you be, you had this fruitfulness that was amazing. And I was just wanted to inquire, how is that? Has it increased even more? Uh, have you come to some more revelation about your interaction with creation and um, how it's unlocking certain things for you and your yeah, and your definitely. yeah, de I'm definitely. I mean, I've continued with the same interaction and um, I've expanded that because I've expanded my garden. So I've, I've got more things growing. Um, last year, I, had a, I focused on the cherries. And again, this year, I engaged with the cherries and protected the cherries while the blossom was on. And we had a huge crop of cherries. Um, I left more cherries this year for the blackbirds because um, we just couldn't eat. We couldn't eat that many. Um, so we just, I left quite a few on the tree and, and they they feasted on them. I then focused on the apple trees. Last year, we, we didn't have a, such a great crop of apples. 
Um, and I think we've got five or six apple trees. And so I focused on them this year. Now, we have so many apples, the actual branches started to bow down. And so I had to I had to stake up the branches to hold up all the fruit because they were just too heavy for the branches on the younger trees. Yeah, the bigger trees and the, the sort of the, the larger trees, obviously, you you they can take it. But some of the smaller trees that we put in the you know, last few years, you know, they started to weigh down under the level of fruit. Um, the same with plums. We planted some plum trees. And again, we, we had a, a good fruit. But this year we we didn't want to um you know strain the tree so sometimes again we left some of the fruit on it and some of the fruit the birds ate it and stuff um but we've got lots of things growing so um i uh have lots of tomatoes or tomatoes as you call them uh, this year um and planted six different varieties to see which ones we would like and they're all you know flourishing you know, full of full of things. And there's a sense of gratitude with creation for its bounty. And then I also um, want to be thankful for creation itself providing. So, you know, years ago, I would have not, you know, weeds in the garden. We don't want weeds in the garden and, you know, and all of that. Um, so you pull up all the weeds before they get too big. But actually, I thought, no, the weeds are the garden's productivity to provide compost. So the more I let the weeds grow in certain places, the more I can harvest, put in the compost bins, and then get more compost. So the weeds are actually the garden providing a source of nitrogen for the compost. And so I, I encourage that this year. Right down the bottom of the garden, I let the bottom of the garden just be overgrown with weeds for a couple of months and when they were about five or six feet high i just went and pulled them all up you know having let them seed because then i'll get a whole load for next year as well and so i got loads of compost for the compost bins um and i so i see it as a way that it, we're cooperating together last year this plant uh, appeared in the garden from nowhere didn't plant it and it was started quite a big plant and it really um uh grew i mean you know and, I, and then it started to have some purple flowers and i thought oh it's quite a nice plant what is it and then i found it was com comfrey now comfrey provides fertilizer when you rot it down in water so i discovered i could get all my tomato fertilizer and plant fertilizer out of the comfrey that the garden had just produced. And so I had 20, I think, 12 bottles of four liters of stuff, which you dilute one in 10. So I had loads and loads of fertilizer out of this comfrey. So then I thought, okay, I'll, I'll transplant it into various parts of the garden, parts I don't use for anything else, on the banks at the bottom of the garden, and now I've got loads and loads of comfrey plants down there. I've already started the first batch of comp, you know, fertilizer for this year. And I'm still using last year's. I've got plenty left that we can feed the plants with. So the garden provided. and But my attitude towards that is thanksgiving. You know, I rejoice in what creation has provided. And I engage with creation in a way which is very different from what I would have used to have, have done. You know, now last year, um, we had lots of, we have a big oak tree and we had a lot of what we call galls, which are where sort of wasps or something in, infect the tree. And then it produces this hard shell around it and then they all fall off. And last year I sort of swept them all up and put them in, put them in the compost, that's sort of brown material for the compost. But I thought, I thought, OK, that can't be doing the tree any good. So I thought, no, I don't want that this year. So I began to think about how can I protect the tree from wasp attack? And we haven't had any this year um, at all, um, which is which is great. You know, and it is part of, I think, working together, looking for um 
a sort of symbiotic relationship. Um, but when you do deal with trees and things like that, do it in a sympathetic way. So, you know, I've had to do some pruning and cutting off some branches which are getting into power lines and all that sort of stuff. But I did it sympathetically and engaged the tree in the, look, I'm not here to hurt. I'm going to cut these branches off, but it's going to give you the ability to spread further this way. But this is not the best way of doing it. But it's always this sort of communication that I feel is part of you know, that type of relationship that you can have. Now, there are some difficult things when you're trying to grow things and there are loads of slugs that eat things. And But you have to have a balance. You know, it's like, OK, I thought. You know, I only use slug pellets because slug pellets can be damaging to to wildlife and things. So I thought, OK, what are the natural ways of dealing with this? Because slugs are also food for frogs and snow worms. And so we had a nice grass snake come into the garden and things this year. Um, and there there are food. So you can't you don't want to get rid of a whole food source because then some animals might not survive. So I thought, OK, how do I manage it? And so I did some research and found that there are some things called nematodes that live in the soil that attack slugs and stop slugs eating. But don't harm the, harm the slug in a way that anything eats it gets harmed. So the slug eventually dies because it's not eating anything. But there's not enough in the soil to, to contain a lot of slugs but you can develop your own. So I made slug soup. So I collected about a hundred slugs of all sorts of varieties, put them in a tub with some green and, the, and about an inch of water. And a percentage of those slugs will have nematoids in them. Uh, and so you then allow them to infect all the other slugs and fill the water with nematoids. So then you can then pour off the water, dilute it and tip it on your garden where you want it to stop slugs infecting all your plants and eating all your plants. So I didn't do it quite early enough this year, but now I've got the technique next year. You know, before I plant anything, I will have harvest a whole load of things for producing, you know, a natural way of controlling the slug population. You know, and then as they slow down their the slugs eating, then the slugs don't reproduce as much. So there are less of them. Um, and you sort of have a natural way of it sort of producing that, you know, and there are other things. You know, I, I tried brambles and all sorts of stuff, putting it around there, trying to stop the slugs crawling over sticky things. But, you know, they're 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 not the nicest of things, slugs. Um, so. Yeah, you know, but next year I'm, I'm, you know, think we'll be able to manage it better and where we're growing things. Last year didn't really have a good crop of lettuce and and salad crops, so I focused on that this year. And this year we've been absolutely inundated with it. Everything grew. We had loads and loads of salad crops. Now, I don't really eat salad much, to be honest. You know, it's like I like greens, but I, I you know. Debbie has salad all the time with her stuff. So she was harvesting salad every day. And we still got a whole load growing. And now I've grown succession planting. So there's another lot growing. And I've just put loads, loads some more seeds, which will come up in a couple of weeks for the next lot. So it's good, good. And but I, I, I'm thankful for it. You know, it's a rejoicing in it and a sense where creation was designed to work together with us um that it is joyful in providing for us you know there's a sense where you feel that relationship and it's great you know it's really good and this year you know we we didn't cut the grass in may and there was we let all the wildflowers come up um, and then in june i cut some circles paths around all the wildflowers so i left them for another couple of months until they'd finished and then harvest it, and then all that went into the compost. And now the lawn sort of, well, the, I wouldn't call it a lawn. It's grass um, and various other green things. Um, but now that's all basically sort of, again, growing nicely, but has contributed to 
the garden in itself and then the birds and they go and eat the seeds and all of that so you get a lot of them and i grow things for the birds i like birds we we use a lot of seed i grow sunflowers so the sunflowers then produce sunflower seeds and i use them to feed the birds in the winter and keep the heads and then harvest all the seeds and keep some of them back to grow next year which is what i've done and um, we have a, a a sunflower growing competition to see who can grow the highest sunflower uh, which i came second in last year um i can't say i put that much effort into it but this year i thought oh well I, i'll put it in a bigger pot and whatever so it's still growing i'm up to about 12 feet high at the moment so it's still going um yeah so yeah i I enjoy gardening I, I enjoy just the things i've cleared a few areas and put some you know grew some flowers and put some perennials in that will come back year after year just tidying it up and and making it look nice but keeping areas which are wild and lots of wildlife can live in and be safe in in that sort of way so yeah that's amazing um that is really neat i recently um, in in Texas, where it's quite hot, I, I recently started a a long compost area, which has been really, which has really taken off and producing amazing soil, a lot of clay and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So you can yeah. use it in areas to yeah. condition or prepare the soil. But in, in some encounters that I've had, Mike, um, what I've been shown is that we're we're on the cusp of of creation, unlocking a lot of secrets that we have not known that have been hidden for a long time and we'll be able to provide things that um that we're not even grasping at have you had some of that um revelation or have you seen some of that as well through your encounter well i, th I think uh, in their creation you feel and sense um where creation is um and uh, yeah, again sometimes you know we've had a double crop of certain things strawberries where we had a good crop and and then you know we're having a, another crop so it feels like there's more fruitfulness coming and i do believe that we should expect fruit to be in season continually or various fruits to be rotationally in season as the tree of life is always in season um now we are in a scenario where we have physical seasons generally which means there's dormant seasons and growing seasons for different plants um but i do believe that the fruit itself will increase and be more fruitful and last longer and increase in season until we've got perpetual fruit fruit all the time rather than seasonal fruit now, some of that is temperature dependent at the moment. Um, but actually, we can look at how that would change in regards to temperature and other things as well. So I do think, yeah, there there are ways. I think watering is an important aspect of it. And some places struggle with water, obviously with drought conditions, and then they struggle to be able to water the plants. But there's technology being developed that is gel water and things where water has a different format obviously water can be you know water it can be ice it can be steam it can be vapor but also it can be gel and there's a sense where they're developing gel water where you can put balls of gel water around a plant and then it releases water slowly into the plant so i think there's things out there technologically discovering properties that God has built into creation that will help us manage that better. Definitely, that's the case. Um, and I'm sure as we mature in sonship, our relationship with creation will develop and that some of those mysteries and secrets will unfold in that we will cooperate together. And there may be things that they require that we can help them with to which then they bless back with fruitfulness and abundance because i think an abundance is the key you know that god created things to be abundant 
Uh, as Jesus said, I've come to give you abundant life. Well, that abundant life is something which we're going to see what it really means. What does abundant life mean? And when we can look at it from a, okay, well, that means abundant life that we have more you know, to enjoy in it or more capacity in it or length of it and fullness of it. But I think that also means more quality of it. So there's all sorts of different things, but abundant life in creation, abundant life in the garden, abundant life, which, which is the blessing. And I think that's it. God bless them to be fruitful and to increase. And I think that blessing is going to be unveiled in different ways to help us in the future because in the future let's say we are going to establish cities of refuge and embassies of heaven and all those things on earth so restoration cities and things like that well how are we going to have energy water food all the supplies that we need uh, how are we going to develop a city if it's, I don't know, how many million people will want to live in a city where there's no sickness, no disease, and everyone's healthy, and you know, how many people want to live there? Well, how are we going to build a, a million houses? Well, maybe we won't build them. Maybe we'll create them. But we'll need land to create them on. Or we'll create them that they can float in the air. You know, we've got to go beyond, you know, like Pandora in, in Avatar, in which they are floating mountains. Well, why not? Gravity is just a law. And we have authority as sons over laws. So they're not there to, for us to be subject to them. We can, Jesus demonstrated his abilities over laws of nature in that he still storms, but he also walked on water and different things of that nature. Therefore, why shouldn't we? And, you know, how did Jesus walk on the water? Jesus levitated up into the air when he went back into the cloud of witnesses. So what was he doing? Defying gravity in some way. Well, why shouldn't we be able to have a city floating in the air rather than on the ground? But then we would need another source. Well, maybe... The atmosphere would provide the moisture that we could condense into water. I think there's all sorts of potential um, discoveries, expansion of our you know, expectations and our you know, beliefs of what's possible. And I think we should be dreaming. You know, be open to those type of expanded dreams of what's possible beyond the limitations. You know, and science fiction can help in that. In that they give you an example of, oh, I never thought of having a city in the sky. But then some scientific film, films have cities in the sky. Yeah, I've yeah, I've saw recently a few of them. That, and it's like, oh, okay, maybe this is a forerunner thing that they're picking up something that we may develop in the future. So we won't be limited to the ground. But then again, you know, maybe we should think of investing in property or in land so that we have got land to be able to build on or grow on and or create on. You know, where's the wisest place to put our money? Maybe not in an electronic system. So maybe if that electronic system fails, what will happen? So maybe God will give us signs to release our finances from a system which basically is not really anything. You know, it's essentially just an electronic fantasy. It's not real. Um, so what would it be like to have all of our funds and assets available to live differently? You know, and I think those are things to think about now and ask God to show us what to do, when to be ready, how to be ahead of the game. As sons of God, we should be ahead of every game everything we should be at the forefront of all new discoveries and advancements and and you know because of the last 150 years of come and rescue us mentality we've abandoned academia we've abandoned science 
rather than being as Christians, we're always at the forefront of science, you know, and discoveries. But then we almost went through this generations, few generations where, well, we're going to get rescued. Everything's going to fall apart. Let's yeah, wait for Jesus to come. And we abandoned being at the forefront of discovery and invention. And I think we should we need to get back there and be ready for whatever's taking place on the earth. We're ready for it. We have the answers. We're able to overcome whatever obstacles and hindrances there are because we are the sons of God. And we should be ready, you know, and we should have the inside track on everything and the knowledge that others don't necessarily have. You know, and to be honest, God has released knowledge into the world that would have been released to believers if they'd been open for it. But they weren't. And they were looking elsewhere in the wrong place for a, a rescue rather than an advancement. You know, the kingdom of God is going to fill the earth. So why are we retreating? We should be advancing and expanding the increase of God's government and peace. But there's a lot of change that needs to take place in people's thinking around that futurist negative perspective of being rescued. You know, because it does limit and hinder a lot of people from taking part in the restoration of everything because they don't believe everything is going to be restored they think everything's going to be destroyed yeah well that doesn't give you any incentive to do anything and that that whole mindset needs to change which is why i think god is is you know, really challenging that mindset one of those doctrine is god is really beginning to uh, expand people's understanding around it and challenge people's thinking around that sort of doctrine to set people free to be able to em embrace restoration. So yes, Mike, you mentioned earlier about abiding, <clears throat> and there seems to be the, this increasing shaking in the uh, global systems. Even mm -hmm. today, stock markets across the world are down yeah. significantly. You know, a lot of cryptocurrencies are down about ten percent or more um, over the weekend. So there is a lot of shaking, and um, we we know that, like you said, the for the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Everything is coming under uh, the kingdom authority, and so these systems of the world will fall away. We do know that, and they are shaking right now, which means abiding is so critical so that shaking doesn't disturb so we have that comfort of a loving father in that relationship. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, because I, my sense is that it's just going to increase the shaking and this disturbance apart from abiding. And um, anyway. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I definitely um, believe that all the systems which have come out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and are the best we've done which are not God's kingdom will eventually begin to crumble and fall. And people will realize, look, this is our best solution, but it is not the solution. It is not the answer It is not, you know, God's best for us and all of that. Um, and I do feel that those shakings and you're seeing signs of it. And I believe that God can show us the signs so that we are ready for what is going to take place when it's going to take place. Now, I'm, I don't believe God wants um, chaos and anarchy and everything to just collapse. But I do feel that you get some signs. And I believe we should be asking God for the signs to say, "What? Well, let's get ready. Let's be aware. Like when Jesus warned them of what was coming to Jerusalem. He warned them to be ready to leave Jerusalem uh, when they saw certain signs. And he gave them some general signs leading up to when this generation was going to end. Um, you know, wars and rumors of wars and famines and all of these negative things. He said, look, these are signs. These, these things are going to happen in the world and whatever. Um, so, you know, be ready. But then he said, here's some specific sign. When you see this taking place, now you need to get out now um and they did and all christians left jerusalem they weren't 
stuck there in the siege of Jerusalem, they escaped because they listened to Jesus. They weren't looking for those signs 2000 years later. They knew those signs were coming in that generation and they were to be ready for them. And Jesus warned them very, very clearly of what to be ready for and to be careful that they didn't sort of put their trust in what their possessions were, but to be willing to leave them all because God's provision would be there for them. And I imagine, you know, all those Christians who went to Pella in the hill country and uh, escaped Jerusalem, they left all their possessions, their houses. You know, Jesus said, look, if you if you if your cloaks on the roof, don't go up and get it, get out. You know, it was a sort of imperative to do this quickly. Uh, and they did. And I think if we're going to see a financial collapse or other systems that are beginning to fail and people are beginning to, you know, I guess think these aren't working any longer for us, then what signs are there? And that, let's ask God to show us. And, you know, you, you said, look, you know, I've, I've asked God to show me some signs and to see what I resonate with as a sign or what's just something that happens. And the other week we had the outage of uh, Microsoft things with an update of a security patch or something, which I think tended to be one rogue file or something essentially wiped out the, the world's sort of capacity to air, use airlines and supermarkets and all sorts of things. And that was just one file. You know, that's, that wasn't like a cyber attack or deliberate. It was just one rogue file which caused mayhem for a few days. And that was probably a week after I said to God, well, give me some insight into some signs to be looking out for. And when that happened, it was like, no, this is one of those signs. This is going to happen more and more. And then you get the instability in. OK, so there's a forecast um in the us of not as much growth or something in the labor market and all of a sudden the far east stock market plunges and then you know the western markets start following suit so why because they're all based on fear you know they're all based on fear and there's nothing good in all that so i do feel that we should be open for God to give us indications of what to do, how to be ready, how to look at those things. And, you know, cryptocurrency was one of the things some people were saying, oh, this is what you need to be invested in. It's, it's not centrally controlled, blah, blah, blah. It's still electronic. If you can't access a computer or your operating system goes down because of some stupid file, then you aren't going to be able to access your cryptocurrency. And it, if you want to get it out, how can you get out something which doesn't really exist? It's, it's intangible. It's not actually mined and there's a piece of metal or something you've got any asset to. So what are you going to do? Well, OK, well, I'm going to transfer it out into my other wallet or something that I can put into my bank. Well, what happens if you can't access your bank? It, it doesn't actually solve the problem. Now, we all work that system because we all live in a world where you need some form of being able to pay for things at the moment. So I'm not suggesting that we all just up and take all our money out and go and live in the wilderness or something. But I think we should be aware that there are signs that we look should look out for. And if there's a time when we should take all our money out, you're not going to do that on the day something happens. You've got to be ready for God to say, when you see this happen, take your money out. And to get all of your money out of all the assets you might have, which are not tangible, but electronic savings accounts or this type of account. Usually you can't access them from a bank and go and take it out. You have to get ready or your pension pots that you might have a lot of money invested in pension pots. Well, they were useless if you can't access it. So I think we should be already thinking now about what is it that will enable us to be ready if this system begins to shake and fall. And if God says, look, now is the time 
you've got you've got this time to get get ready and then what do we do with the money if we should get our, all our money out into hard currency then that's likely to devalue very quickly if the financial system is shaken so what do we do with it well we need to ask god again what should we invest it in gold silver lithium i don't know hydrogen um, what should we invest it in land something that is going to enable us to continue in the transition when things begin to become unstable into the place where we're beginning to live in a different grid of reference where heaven is manifesting where we don't need those systems but in the interim we've got to be ready for the transition and i think god will show us if we're if we're open to him to seek him for it yeah but as you say stay rest is key we can't be so panicked. I, I really i really like the passion translation mike um yeah. psalm 23 i think gives us a clue mm. to kingdom currency and we will have a kingdom currency yeah um you know the joy economy we've talked about yeah. Yeah. um yeah. where we we are in the wheelhouse of what how what our thumbprint was when when before the foundation when god knit, knit us in the secret place in our mother's womb how we were created there's special gifts that we each have that are amazing that are untapped but in the in psalm 23 verse 1 the kingdom currency is going to be more than enough and in psalm 23 says yahweh is my best friend and my shepherd i always have more than enough so there's more than enough concept of being in that place where we are fruitful we have we have plenty and you've demonstrated that with your testimony about your garden mm -hmm. and so just that shift in mindset about that currency and that medium of exchange and knowing that as sons and he is a good father we have more than enough absolutely um, yeah and we can rest in his provision and goodness and in our ability to generate what we need because that's what he's teaching us we have the ability to do everything jesus had and greater works than those so we need to be able to expand our thinking and not limited and then not panicked not in fear because as soon as you start operating in fear you're not in rest and you're not going to manifest anything other than the fear that you're resonating with we need to resonate with peace and rest in god trusting in god but also developing what we can do to be able to manifest the things that we need whether that be by creating them calling them into being choosing the reality to form around us all of that type of dynamic but it's never going to operate if we're if we're in fear or anxiety or worry and we're panicked so we need to be ready prepared for whatever is going to come in the future because we are sons of god you know the earth is going to look to us creation is looking for us the world is going to look to us because we will have answers where no one else does and if they want answers, where are they going to look for them when their normal answers are coming from are gone? So let's say the political system doesn't provide the answers. Where are they going to go then? Financial system no longer provides the answers. Where are they going to go? Well, we're going to go where they can find those answers to be manifesting, where heaven is manifested on earth, where the kingdom of God is beginning to expand and increase, where God's government of peace is manifested where there is a well-being economy where it's more about us being well and at peace and rest rather than how much we've got and how many of this we've got and how big of this we've got it's like those things aren't important when it comes to the real things of enjoying life from a different sort of perspective now i'm not against having a nice house and a nice car and all those things but actually in the future those are not going to be the things that we value we're going to value being joyful and thankful and living in a state of rest you know rather than panicking and frantic and oh i haven't got enough and 
you know, all of the things that you can have in when systems begin to crumble. Because you can't rely on them anymore. You know, and it's like, oh, well, the government's collapsed. Well, there's no social welfare anymore. No, but there's kingdom welfare. You know, and the kingdom of God looked after people. God's people looked after each other and looked after others. They didn't weren't just in it for themselves. They were manifesting God's grace and mercy. You know, the early church were known for taking in those that have been thrown out. Even rescuing babies that have been abandoned and things. They were known for looking out for the widows and the orphans and caring. You know, they even set up people to manage how they could feed and look after people. And I think that's a sign of what it should be like for us to be in a place of replacing earthly government with heavenly government. Not a political thing, but an opportunity of manifesting blessing and love. You know, and I think that that really is the key. And I think that's really what I feel God is uh, going to enable us to do. You know, and to demonstrate that. You know, uh, and I and I see things changing. In that we start to totally change the way we. Uh, begin to think about life and what's important and what what value we put on things and i think well-being um, is the greatest value because it's the being well with our soul you know and so our soul is at peace and rest we're not french french frantic we're not anxious we're not worried we're not concerned you know, we're we're at peace and rest. We're in the eye of the storm where everyone else is panicking because of the storm. Yeah. So I I you know really am looking for um yeah you know, the perspective of God's kingdom at working, you know. The rest is an absolute key. Yeah, you're at rest. And why? Because we're in trusting in him. You know, we're trusting in him. It's amazing you said we trust in him because in the currency of the U.S. it says in God we trust. Yeah. How much of that is actually <laughs> true? <laughs> <laughs> it's something that's said, but how, how true is it, you know? Um, and I think God really wants us to to trust in him and trust in the abilities that he's given us as sons of God to be able to administrate the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. You know, there is no lack in heaven. You know, there's there's no sickness in heaven. There's no war in heaven. There's no, none of that negativity in heaven. Yeah, and so therefore we want to see how God rules in heaven established on earth as we outwork his rule by blessing. And I think that's the key, is bringing, bringing the blessing of God. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.